Peter chapter 2 verses 4 to 8. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by human beings but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Hello everyone. How does it feel? How does it feel to be on your own, with no direction home, a complete unknown, like a rolling stone? Maybe you feel like that sometimes, particularly so given all that's been going on in the world recently. Uh, and that's a quote from uh, the chorus of the Bob Dylan song, Like a Rolling Stone. And I was reminded of it as I was looking at these verses, because our passage on 1 Peter uses the picture and imagery of a stone to aid our understanding. But not like a rolling stone. And I think this quote from Dylan, the Dylan song is helpful for us as we begin because actually it describes the complete opposite of what these verses in 1 Peter are actually teaching. Now that's not to deny that at times we can feel lonely, directionless and so on. But these verses in 1 Peter teach something very, very different. That the reality for all Christians is actually that we're not on our own. We do have a purpose and we are certainly not unknown. So let's get into these verses and see how they work themselves out. And, and we can see that in every single verse we're looking at, the word stone is repeated. In fact, it's mentioned nine times in these verses. So the word stone is going to be a hard touchstone, if you like, as we navigate this passage and try to understand what Peter is teaching his original readers and what God is teaching us today. And we're going to do that by asking ourselves three pairs of questions that I hope will help us to get into this passage and capture, appreciate a, and be encouraged by the majesty of what Peter is telling us here. So the first pair of questions. Who is the living stone? And who are the living stones? Who is the living stone? Well, this is referred to in verse four. And no, I'm not trying to trick you. The answer is... Jesus. And the rest of verse 4 describes Jesus, doesn't it? Rejected by humans. He was crucified on the cross, but chosen by God and precious to him. Jesus, as God's son, was chosen to carry out God's salvation plan, and so is precious to him. I'm going to come back to those descriptions later. But I want us to go a bit deeper into the passage in answering this question of who is the living stone? You see, nowhere else in the Bible is Jesus described as the living stone. And in fact, this imagery we see in verses four to five is unique to Peter. But it's not come out of nowhere. As we can see in verses six, seven and eight, Peter is quoting three bits of the Old Testament. Uh, in verse six, he's quoting Isaiah chapter 28. Um, in verse seven, he's quoting Psalm 118. And in verse eight, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter eight. And all these passages of scripture were recognised in Jewish thought as pointing forward to the Messiah, the promised king, the anointed one who would make God's kingdom a reality. And this was the case even before Jesus was born. So the picture, the image of the Messiah described as a stone is rooted deep in the Old Testament. But look at the quotes in verses six and seven. This isn't any old stone isn't just some piece of rubble, it's the cornerstone. 
Now, older other translations might talk or use the word capstone, but cornerstone is more helpful here, I think, because it describes a key foundation stone that is placed down and upon which all the other stones are orientated and positioned. Um, without a cornerstone, you have a rubbish building, even if it manages to stay erect at all. So if it doesn't sound too much of a contradiction in terms, a cornerstone is central to the construction of a building. And we particularly see that imagery in verse 6, and that quotes Isaiah uh, chapter 28, verses 16. God is putting down a marker, he's putting down a hill, a, sorry, putting down a stone on the hill of God, that's what Zion is, and this stone is the cornerstone. It would not be moved, it's central to God's plan, and it's precious. This cornerstone is a Messiah, it's God's promised king because those who trust in him will not be put to shame. Jesus is the cornerstone. And in fact, Jesus also applies Old Testament passages, including these, a couple of these ones here, to himself as well, describing himself as a promised cornerstone. You can look that up later if you want. Uh, Matthew 21 is a, a good example of that. So who is the living stone? It's Jesus. But the meaning is of Jesus as the centrepiece, the crucial priest, the promised cornerstone of God's salvation plan. And Peter is drawing in all that Old Testament background and imagery. Um, and also Peter's self uh, sorry, Jesus' self-declaration in his use of the term here, living stone. Um, but why the living part of it? Why living stone? Well, simply, I think it's to remind us that Jesus is alive. As you come to him, verse four, Jesus is not just an idea, not, not a dead Messiah, not a dusty old rock. He is alive and active, but like a cornerstone, he's not going anywhere. Who are the living stones? Well, we'll quickly answer this question. Um, verse five says, you also like living stones. And this refers to who Peter describes in verse four as coming to the living stone. That is coming to Jesus. So this is describing Christians, those who believe, as verse 7 puts it. But in these verses, Peter is wanting us to think corporately and not individually. All the yous are plural in nature, and the living stones are more than just a single stone. So the living stones is describing the church, the community of believers. So we've answered who. The next pair of questions are how questions. How do we describe the living stone? And how do we describe the living stones? Three words, chosen, precious, rejected. These three words describe both the qualities of Jesus, the living stone, and as the church, who are the living stones. And if we think about that, that's pretty incredible. And we can see that this is true in how verses four and five link together. Verse four is pretty clear, isn't it? Jesus is the living stone. And the rest of verse four tells us that Jesus was rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. Rejected, chosen, precious are three key words. Now this is a mind blowing bit. Look at the start of verse five. You also like living stones. Jesus is the living stone, which means he's rejected, chosen and precious. And if we are also like living stones, then these descriptions apply to us as well. Chosen, precious, rejected. It's a bit like the phrase, um, she's a chip off the old block, describing a daughter as like a mother, because she exhibits the same characteristics. Let's look at these descriptions. Each one is, I think, wonderfully encouraging in their own way. So chosen, Jesus was chosen by God. We've already looked at the Old Testament background, which evidences that Jesus, the living stone, was chosen way before his human birth to be the cornerstone of salvation. Jesus, his being, his life, his death and his resurrection, they're not an accident. Or as verse six puts it, I lay a stone. God says, I appoint this stone in this position. Jesus is the one chosen by God to enact and carry out his salvation plan. But that chosenness, it doesn't just apply to Jesus. It applies to us, the living stones as well. You, 
me, the church, the community of God, are chosen by him. And we don't just see that here, that's a theme throughout this letter. The first two verses of chapter one also bring it up. Um, describes the scattered churches as God's elect. And Peter says, you are chosen according to the foreknowledge, foreknowledge of God the Father. No Christian is an accident. No true church is an accident. You and they are chosen by God. And we see that later in verse nine as well, where the church is described as a chosen people. It's always nice to be chosen, isn't it? Um, I remember at school where um, you'd have a, you know, pick a team like a football team and you'd have two captains, two of the better kids at football and you'd be lined up and you'd always hope that you would be picked, picked early on or picked first ideally to be in the team. And there was nothing worse than being left right till the end. And at that point, sometimes the team captains didn't care. They've got the best players. And so often you'd sort of walk up to the, the, the captain and say, um, shall I go on your team then? And they, they might go, all right, yeah, you can do. That's not great, is it? You want to be chosen first. But God cares and God chose you. He chose you to be part of the church and the community he is building that's centred on Jesus, the precious cornerstone. And it's not because you're special. It's not, so not because I'm special. It's not because you're good or handsome or beautiful or intelligent or have life worked out. It's not for any of those reasons. It's purely because of God's grace, undeserved by you. But it's not an accident. You've not made the team while God was looking the other way. Be encouraged, Livingstone. You were chosen. So let's look at the next word, precious. So we're thinking about being chosen, but what about if God changes his mind? I mean, you know, to give a more trivial example, sometimes you might choose and, and buy a jumper or a dress and you might really love it. Uh, and you get it home, and you might wear it a couple of times, but then the initial excitement, it, it wears off. You chose it, but, but now it sits at the back of the wardrobe. It's not precious to you at all anymore. It's gone out of fashion and in fact, you're not going to wear it anymore. Is that what it's like with, with God when he chooses us? Well, let's get back to Jesus, the living stone. We said he was chosen, but he's also described as precious in verses four, six and seven. Now, we don't doubt God the Father's love for Jesus, do we? God's not going to unchoose Jesus or regard what Jesus has done as less precious. No, Jesus is the precious cornerstone on whom all salvation rests. So Jesus is precious to God in verses four and five. But look at verse seven. Jesus is also precious to us who believe. And drawing on, you know, lots of other stuff, it's because we are in Christ. It's because we're children of God alongside Jesus, who is the firstborn. It's because we are living stones like him, resting on him, saved by him, that we are precious to God. Jesus will always be precious to God. And so, so for those whom Jesus has bought salvation and freedom from, from sin through his precious blood. They, and that's us, are precious to God too. You, me, Avenue Church are precious to God. Not gonna get bored of us and leave us in the back of the metaphorical heavenly wardrobe. In fact, he has plans for us. And we'll soon see that later. Final word, rejected. The living stone was rejected. Jesus was rejected by humans. We know that's Christians, he's crucified. And there's more I want to say about that because humans are still uh, rejecting Jesus today and we do need to deal with that. And the passage makes that clear. But we, like living stones, are also rejected. Again, this is a theme of the letter. Chapters one, verse six, and later verse 20 in chapter two, talk about the sufferings and persecutions that Peter says and knows his readers are undergoing. And here and throughout the letter, Peter keeps making the point, what happened to Jesus will happen to you. Jesus, a living stone, is rejected in verse seven. And so we as living stones, as Christians, as a church, are going to be rejected too. It might be a snide comment or a Twitter feed um, railing against the intolerance of Christians or someone exclaiming, how could you believe this? And in some countries and places, 
physical persecution that can even result in death. But it's important to understand this rejection is not a mistake, nor should it be a surprise. It's what humans do to the living stone and to the living stones. And when we face stuff like that, we can be tempted to feel really small, very out of step with the world, and sometimes even ashamed. You believe that? Really? But take encouragement from verse 6, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Jesus, the precious cornerstone, is not going anywhere. He is rock steady. And in the final analysis, when all creation is wrapped up, you who've trusted in him, you will not have been put to shame. In fact, you'll be exalted into glory alongside Jesus. So be encouraged that as living stones, we're accepted and not rejected by God. And this eternal acceptance does not alter or change. So now we come to our final pair of questions, which are what questions? What are the consequences for those who reject the living stone? And what are the consequences for those who come to the living stone? I want to look at verses 7 to 8 to answer the first question. Now, to help us do that, I want you to imagine a stone. And to help those of you with poor imaginations, I have a stone here. There we go. It's a stone. Now, is this stone important? Is it something you would build upon? Or is it junk, a piece of rubble you just cast aside? Now, when Peter quotes Psalm 118, verse 7, he's making a similar point. Some builders, they've looked at a stone... Maybe they've examined it carefully, and after doing so, they've made a judgment. And that judgment is that the stone is rubbish, it's rubble, it's not fit for building with, and they've cast the stone aside. But they've got it wrong, horribly so. They've not just mistaken a bad stone for a good stone, they've thrown away the cornerstone, the most crucial stone, the stone upon which the whole building needs to be built and is orientated around. They've made a catastrophic mistake. Peter then goes on to quote Isaiah 8 in verse 8. And can we can see that this stone that was cast aside, not only was it the cornerstone, but to those who throw it away, it's a treacherous stone. It's a stone you can trip over, fall over. It's a stone that you can't avoid and you'll come a cropper. Jesus is a living stone. And those who don't believe in him, verse 7, those who reject the good news about him, in verse 8, have made a catastrophic mistake. And they'll stumble over him, as I've already described. This stone, this living stone, it is important. It's Jesus. Now, there may be someone watching this, I don't know. And it may be that you you maybe looked at Jesus before and you've actively rejected him. Maybe just ignore him. Or maybe Jesus is someone you pay lip service to. Perhaps just see as a good example, as a nice teacher. Essentially what that means, to use Peter's analogy, is you see Jesus as about as useful to you as this stone. Maybe less so. But Peter says you've made a mistake. You've rejected Jesus, the cornerstone, and the linchpin of God's salvation plan. You're throwing away the most precious thing imaginable. If someone put a diamond in your hand, you wouldn't throw it away, would you? He'd recognise its worth. And to reject Jesus, to throw away that which is most eternally precious, it's an act of monumental self-harm. Far worse than uh, tricking away a diamond. And if that's you, what Peter says in verse 8 is that your rejection of Jesus is not without consequence. Your rejection of Jesus will hurt. You may not feel it now, but Peter says that there's eternal consequences. And he's using illustration and metaphor to, to kind of tell us that. It's saying your eternal fate depends on whether you believe in or reject Jesus. Rejection means eternal and painful separation from Jesus and all that is good. So can I ask you, take another look at the living stone. Take another look at Jesus. There's no one like him. He is alive and you can come to him even today. So we've answered the question, what are the consequences for those who reject the living stone?
But what are the consequences of those who come to the living stone? I'm going to do that by focusing on verse 4 and especially verse 5 to try and answer this question. And what we have here is a truly, it's a truly beautiful image. And I desperately want to, to do it justice in, in trying to explain it. And so if at the end of this you don't see it as beautiful, then the fault is entirely mine. Because this is truly wonderful. So we have Jesus, our living stone. He's chosen. He's precious. He's rejected by humans, but it's actually the cornerstone. And Christian believers are the living stones that are being built into a beautiful spiritual building. And Jesus is the living cornerstone of that building. Without him, th there's no building. But with him, there is a beautiful edifice of unparalleled beauty. And so in my mind's eye, there are loads of stones, beautiful stones, and, and they're floating down into position to form this building. And, and pulling these stones in is the most beautiful, massive stone, which all these other stones are orbiting around as they come into position. And what is this beautiful building? This spiritual house, this temple of the spirit? It's the church. It's the global church. It's the church through history. It's the church that Peter is writing to. It's Avenue Church. We are like living stones being built by God into his church with Jesus the living stone at the centre, pulling us in, knitting us together, forming us into the, his church. And the church is God's spirit-filled temple, each Christian alive with the Holy Spirit. It's God's dwelling place on earth with Jesus, its living cornerstone. And this fulfills all the stuff in the Old Testament, which we don't have time to go into, about where will God dwell on earth? Where will he live? Is it in a tent? In a temple? No, ultimately, in the spirit-filled church with Christ as its cornerstone. And this magnificent picture has a few key applications for us, which we shouldn't miss. So number one, a Christian is always in the church. In fact, if you're a Christian, you have no choice in the matter. You are being built, verse five says. God is building you as a living stone into his church. You don't choose as a Christian whether you're part of a church or not. These verses say you already are. The question is, are you living out that in reality? Are you stuck into Avenue? Or let me put it another way. Is church precious to you? Or is it just a lifestyle add-on? A nice thing to do? Jesus and the church are precious to God. He's building something incredible. Are you on board with that? Are you invested in that? Because to be a Christian is to be integral to the life and growth of the church. And I'm not talking about church in the abstract. I'm talking about our church avenue. And believe me, I know it's hard and weird at the moment um, to work out what this looks like, given the difficulties we face as individuals and as church during these COVID times. But we can stop and examine ourselves. Is the way I'm living life now reflecting how precious Avenue Community Church should be in my life. Second point from here. Church is a community. Jesus is the cornerstone, but the cornerstone on its own does not a building make. It's living stones that are built into the spiritual house. If a stone is missing in a wall, it's going to be a drafty building. So God builds his church with living stones so there are no gaps. That means Avenue Church, us. We are all important we're all necessary to the building of the church that means you it also means the person you really like and it also means a person you find it more difficult to get along with or have less common in with are just as important we're all living stones we're all a bit different we all look a bit different have different um, things that we like or different characteristics and personalities different gifts that god has given with us that's okay god knows that and it's not an accident that you're part of the church. So we need to value each other because God, God values each of us. Chosen and precious, remember? And because we have differences, but are all living stones, it's the focus on Jesus and keeping him central that allows us as Avenue Church, as a group of different people, to continue to function. We need to have Jesus in common to be able to function as a church. Which brings us to third point. Church is united around Jesus. It may sound trite, but it's not. It's central. 
and it's central because Jesus is central. Jesus is the cornerstone, remember? And a building without a cornerstone will collapse, as we've said. It's not fit for purpose. A church that takes its eyes off Jesus and centres itself or its mission on something other than Jesus is not going to function. And we all have a responsibility to keep each other and the elders honest in that regard. We can make all sorts of mistakes in, in this way. And some examples are that we might put a particular individual on a pedestal. Or we might focus on creating the perfect meeting. Or try to make ourselves relevant to our culture to the exclusion of our beliefs. Uh, or just do the nice social bits related to church and ignore anything with Bible in it. We all can have different tendencies in this regard. But we need to help each other. And challenge each other, making sure we keep our eyes on Jesus. So these are some of the consequences of those who come to the living stone. Um, but verse 5 describes uh, not only the church as a spiritual house, but also as a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So in Old Testament terms, the church isn't just a temple building, it's a priesthood that serves in the temple as well. And you'll see that Peter picks up this image uh, again in verse 9. In fact, so rich is verse 9 and 12 in this imagery of the church that Rich and Dan are going to spend a few weeks uh, working through that. I'm going to spend some time unpacking those verses and helping us uh, to understand that as a church. So I'm not going to say much more about the priesthood picture that Peter, Peter first mentions here, because we're going to pick up on that later. But what I will say, just quite simply, is that this then tells us that what we're seeing here is not a passive image of the church. Finally, church has a job. The offering of spiritual sacrifices, uh, as Peter puts it. And Peter's here talking about a life and life transformed by the spirit that results in behaviour that honours God. It's a picture of Christian community centred on Jesus that Peter presents as an active one. Life is lived and stuff is done in a Christ-centred, spirit-filled way that honours God. It's whole life worship essentially is a response to what God has done for us. And no aspect of life is outside this, be it family, be it work, be it a Sunday morning or a Friday night, be it friendships or conflicts. Uh, and even though, you know, we might say, well, we're at work on our own, church can still be involved in that. Church can still support us in that. We can pray for each other in our workplaces. Your home group can't be with you at work, but their prayers for you are a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God. As an example. So. As we conclude, I'm going to um, paraphrase Bob Dylan, and I apologise to any Bob Dylan fans. How does it feel, church? How does it feel to be chosen and precious, to not be on your own, but to be part of a church, like a living stone? Whatever the next few weeks and months bring, please let us as a church live out the reality of church that Peter describes here. A community of believers united around Jesus, living for him. <laughs>